Hello everybody and welcome to Honor Thy Podcast. This is the weekly DC TV Arrowverse podcast where we discuss everything Arrowverse. I'm your host Declan McKinney, you may know me as DC TV Talk, and with me as always is my co-host Dan McCants, otherwise known as Mule Kick Media. Hey what's up, we're not going to talk Monkey Dust this week, that's the no, only time no, we're going to reference it. No Monkey Dust this week. Uh, I know. I'm, I'm going to miss it, I know yeah. you will as well. I'm, dis- I'm depressed because like, whenever I go to university I usually hear some really funny stories about it, but I've heard none this week, which is kind of depressing. Depressed, get a monkey dust, lad, it'll get, sort you right up. Want to um, eat someone? You want to eat someone's face? Get some monkey dust. You want to burgle someone's house? Get monkey dust. Basically, it's the solver of all your problems. <laughs> and again, I would like to reiterate that this podcast is not sponsored or endorsed by Monkey Dust. <laughs> uh, also, I'd just like to mention that I am trying a new podcasting position this week. I'm currently lying on my bed because I was waiting for Dan to finish Legends, and I thought, well, I'm gonna have a chill. And yeah, I'm just really comfy right now. You so. make this sound really negative, but I have to go to uni, which means I have to drive no, into no, a city all day and come back. back. I'm really happy. Yeah, but you're, ma- you're making it sound as if I've been gone for ages, though. Like, oh, I was just lying on the bed whilst well, he's watching 15, Legends. 15, 20 minutes, because we were, we were having a laugh at the IGN reviews for a bit as well. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. IGN. I, I, I want to say, what's it, what's his name of the guy who does the IGN reviews? Was it Jesse Sheridan or something? Whatever his name is. If you're watching this, you're an absolute fucking ham roll, mate. I will find you. I will fly over to the States and I will spank you for your awful reviews. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, you, let's, let's just talk about this shit. You gave The Demon, which is this week's episode of Arrow, a 6.8. What drugs are you on, fam? Get some monkey dust. That's some legit drugs. Because that that score, shit. Fucking new. That is my rant on Jesse Sheridan. Word. So, <laughs> that I just went incredibly retro. I'm, I apologize for that. I'll go jump off a cliff. Um, so, <laughs> um, we, uh, we've got first little bit of news here that I want to discuss. Um, we have the f- uh, episode description synopsis for episode seven of Arrow this season. And normally we wouldn't really mention stuff like this unless it was really significant. But this one actually is significant because we found out that this episode is actually going to be directed by uh, James Bamford, who is most known for doing the the premieres and the finales. He's pretty much like the big director. Yeah. Now, I'll just read quickly out the description. So, Oliver makes a choice that will affect his entire life as well as the lives of everyone that he cares about. So, with all that being said, and the fact that James Bamford is directing this episode, this has got to be Prison Break. Yeah, this this has got to be the episode he gets out. It's got to be. And more specifically, uh, he, it is going to be a prison break because, you know, James Bamford, he, every time he directs an episode, you know that you're going to get a huge action set piece because that's what he does. That's what he's a stunt guy. That's what he knows what he does. So with that being said, and also this episode is called The Slab Side Redemption, which obviously the Shawshank Redemption is about which a is, prison break. Which is, I'm going to say this right now, the best movie ever made, Shawshank Redemption. Just, just throwing that out there. It is the best movie ever made. It, it, it is. There's a reason it's rated a 9.4 on IMDb. Wow. Big words from Big Dan. Um, yeah, have you seen it? I have not seen it. How have you not? It's like, it's on TV like every two weeks. How have you not seen it? I'm, I, I can't watch films on TV. I can't stand the ad breaks, man. Oh, you get an ad like that's... every 15 minutes. The, then buy it on Blu-ray. The Maybe best I film ever made. Is the best film ever made. But anyway... This episode is surely going to be the prison break. Um, it's a real shame that Captain Cold and Heatwave are not in the prison because yeah, they're that, the kind that would of guys have been... he needs. You never know, Joseph Forrest might show up for a cameo. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. uh, we need that. Um, <laughs> this is very exciting to me. Now, when we look at next week's episode of Arrow, um, I don't remember the title, um, but it's uh, episode six. Uh, we can see that Laurel is going to be doing some law stuff in order to try and get Oliver out of prison and doing it yes, in son. an awful way. Now, Mm -hmm. my prediction is that that's going to go wrong, and eventually they realise, well, the only way Oliver's going to get out of here is if he breaks out. And the fact that the description says that he makes a choice that's going to affect his life and everyone else's lives... Which is that he'll become a fugitive. Yeah, he'll become a fugitive, and obviously his family will then become targets. Um, So, I I want this to happen. This is the the right direction, because it's interesting and it's different. Because if if Oliver just gets out... Because the way I look at it is, when Oliver gets out of prison, what's he going to do? Like yeah, what's it like? Because he, he can't. He can't walk around in the public, arrow. can he? You, yeah, no. he can't do that, and he can't. He's not going to become. I can't see him like just becoming the Green Arrow again. Even no. though he was the new Green Arrow, obviously some people no. are like, oh well, you know, could it be that guy? Blah blah blah. It just it doesn't feel right. So I feel like this is the right step 
and just to make him a fugitive. Yeah. Which I think is well, really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, just based on that, like, yeah, I think what will probably happen is, like you said, they'll try and take the legal option of taking it to court ne- next episode. That'll fail, and then, yeah, like you said, that'll kind of is what triggers Oliver to realize, like, the, if I'm going to get out of here, the only way is to break out and become a fugitive. And I've had kind of like a theory in the back of my head. I, I genuinely think that maybe we could go like a stupid amount of time this season before Oliver actually suits up as the Green I, Arrow. I agree with that. I, 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 I've been I, saying this for a while. I think, you know, because everyone was saying, oh, when Oliver gets out, he'll become the new Green Arrow. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, has anybody considered the fact that maybe he just won't become the Green Arrow again? Like, has anybody yeah. thought about this? Like, I was Because like, I know this is like, it sounds outlandish because obviously it's about Arrow. He's the main character. He's been the Green Arrow for bloody, like six years you know why would he give up now but it's just you know with all the bold directions this season's taking i wouldn't put it past Bash schwartz <laughs> i wouldn't i'm just saying yeah i mean I, i've actually i would love it if he just spends like the whole season without the suit and then when he actually suits up he puts on the season one to three suit oh that'd be nice and and, and then it'd be cool if he does that and he redeems himself but not only that he like redeems what he did in season three you know because his reputation was tarnished yeah it'd be yeah. awesome if he did that like and also because I'm a bit of a fanboy for that original suit, mm. like that is, that, I'll say it right now because I've been rewatching like the early seasons of Arrow recently. That is my favorite Arrow suit. It yeah, just pips it over the season five to six one it for me good. personally. And I think it would be awesome as well, just because like, you know, I have a feeling maybe at the end of the season he will suit up and we will get the old team back, and it'll be yeah. like this thing where, you know, the like let's just say Star City is going to get taken over again by whoever we don't know. And then, just, like, the government and the SCPD should be like, we need you. Like, it doesn't matter what's happening. We, we just need you right now. And that's how yeah. we'll kind of become accepted. Because um, that's kind of like what happened in Season 2 when he, you know, yeah. saved, it, saved Star City from Deathstroke and everything. So I think it might be a similar situation to that. Um, but I would be perfectly happy if he goes the entire season without the hood. Mm. I, I mean, I don't. Bold direction. Yeah, I mean that that'd be bold. I don't think they do it simply for the fact that I think they have to appease the fans who obviously want to see him in the Green Arrow suit. But I think they'll probably uh, take like as much time as they need before he actually puts the hood on. Which I, I would commend even more because like that would take some serious skill to do like like properly and not feel like okay, we're just like waiting for him to hood up. So. That'll be interesting, uh, but I'm very excited for this episode uh, to, to see what will actually happen and what it means for the rest of the season. And even if it's not Prison Break, we know we're going to get a pretty awesome action sequence regardless. Yeah, uh, there's, got, there's going to be at least there's going to be at least one fight scene that will just fanboy over completely. I mean, there always is with James Bamford, isn't there? Because, like, what was it? Last season, in the season finale, you had, what was it, the... Oliver Diaz the, fight. Oh, uh, like, that, that was euphoric. And then it was, like, the first episode, you had that fight scene when they had it in the showers and i was oh that it's like th- that kind of stuff is like it, and i think the thing the reason he does such a good job is because of the fact that he used to be the stunt coordinator he knows how to do shit and i think if they have like a massive prison like breakout scene it's going to be even better because you've got him behind the camera with it like oh I-, I can't i can't wait for it yeah i mean I just, like, we, we get like so excited about Arrow yeah. this season but it's, yeah. it's been I- so good yeah i actually might be more excited for this episode than the mid-season finale which is kind of crazy because you shouldn't really be like that for a show. Yeah, it seems like maybe that. Because thing is with the mid-season finale, I think that that's really going to focus on the new Green Arrow. Because obviously it is called mm. Unmasked. Yeah. So and obviously, I mean, we all know it's Amico Green, but it's just like mm. yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, that would make sense. That would line up because then Oliver should be out of prison for that moment where he finds out oh he's got a half sister. I mean, unless they might make the relation different, but you know what I mean, like. Yeah, I think it's got to be half sister. I yeah. think. I think. I mean, I can't help but think that maybe Willa Holland feels a bit cheated by that. But oh, <laughs> uh, uh, definitely. But, I mean, she didn't want to be on the show, so you know. Yeah, she, she didn't. She didn't even want to be Speedy, so uh, you know. So anyway, moving over, we just two hours ago got a first official look at Batwoman Ruby Rose as Batwoman from Entertainment Weekly, and you know, bef- let's just put aside for a second everything we we hate about Ruby Rose. Just I can't though because it sh- her face is there. <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> based on this picture alone, she looks pretty awesome in this suit. Now, acting talent is a separate question. We'll get to that. But just based on the suit, like, just the suit, it looks sick. Like, that looks great. Yeah, the the suit looks dope. 
Um, I actually, like, I saw some comments, though, that made me laugh, because, you know, obviously she's holding the grapnel hook in the photo, yeah. and I saw, I, I, I just thought in my head, there's gonna be people in the comments, aren't there, saying that she's holding a gun, and lo and behold, there was, and it's like, oh, they're inspired by Snide as Batman, because he ho- she holds guns. What? <laughs> I've seen people comment this, there I'm not joking. people on Twitter, man. Like, I mean... <laughs> Just have anybody look look at that gun? I'm mean, looking at it right now. That's not a gun. And like it's. It, it's I mean, I mean, gun. where's the trigger? There's no trigger on it. No. <laughs> it's just like, do people even know Batman at all? Like, do they even know people. life? Do they know life? <laughs> um, but this suit. I mean, we've all said this from day one. Like as soon as we've seen like the first official image and stuff that the CW released. This suit is just on point. Like it's so comic accurate. It looks great. It looks like it fits in with the Arrowverse, and like that wig is great. Especially because, like, a lot of people get confused by this as well. But like, it is actually supposed to be a wig. Cause, yeah, because like, it is in the comics. In the comic, it's part of like her identity. Like her secret identity is to throw people off with the hair. So I assume Ruby Rose is just gonna have like a natural haircut in this, like the quite short hair, and then she's gonna have that wig, and then you have like the cowl with the ears that come out on the top, which is great. The mask is awesome. The overall suit looks great. I mean, it's not really like a full body shot. That you can no, because I mean, you've still you've still got yeah, because the, obviously the bottom half's cut off. But yeah, yeah I mean, I mean the fact it's crouching in this photo, but it's yeah. still kind of cut off. But you know, mm. I mean, the fact that they've started like they've released this, which is like the proper like first photo yeah. of her in action in the crossover, because obviously the, the only other ones we had before were the ones that the other actors took on set, or obviously the the original release photo. But this is like the first one in proper live action. Yeah. Um, which make which makes me think that it can't be that long now till we get a trailer yeah. and we actually see it, yeah. like in video I'm, form. I'm so excited about that. Uh, yeah, we should. I reckon. I reckon in the next two, three, well, two weeks probably. Yeah, I reckon within two weeks because I mean, I'm trying to think now. When's the crossover again? Is it the December the eighth that starts? So December the eighth. Yeah, ninth I... is ninth. Sorry. Yeah, so I'd, I'd reckon yeah within the next two weeks it's got to come out I because I mean the if... Crisis on Earth X trailer came out on November the twenty seventh, so yeah, mm, which was quite late because I'm pretty sure the Invasion one I think came out earlier if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, it's it's quite funny because because also like we're getting a, another big trailer this month supposedly as well. We're getting Avengers four, uh, hopefully oh. this month as well. So we have got two massive trailers coming out. Uh, oh yeah, great. yeah, and, 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 and off, yeah. Go on, go on. I was just going to say that, you know, because we're speaking about Marvel, just uh, rest in peace to Stanley. Uh, oh, yeah, and I, yeah. I, yeah, obviously, this is a DV, DC, you know, podcast, but obviously, you know, Stanley, he's a big inspiration to a lot of people. So um, just rest in peace to him, you know, thoughts with his family and all that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a person who is just as creative, creatively inspired as he is. And just like, you know, his passion was unparalleled. <laughs> And the yeah. fact he was able to put that passion to paper and, you know, cr- the fact that he had that ability and create so many characters and stories that we all love, you know, he, he was a truly special man and very inspirational to all of us. So, rest yeah. in peace, Stanley, he was truly yeah. a legend and uh, yeah. he missed. I'm, I'm going to be crying like hell now in Avengers 4 when I watch <laughs> I this know, cameo. Yeah. Everyone's just going to cry in the I cinemas. I really hope they do, like, a nice, like, I, I, I was talking to a guy in work about this. I think what they should do is they should have, like, th- I don't know how many post credit scenes they're going to have for Avengers 4. But one of them should be like a commemoration for Stanley. Like, yeah. Whether it's like it, showing I, all of his cameos at once, or if it's just like you know a special thing. But I feel like they need to do that, especially because I mean, they've said he's filmed his cameo for Avengers Four. Um. So Avengers Four will be his final MCU performance, and his final Marvel cameo in general. So I feel like they need to do something. Yeah. I mean, obviously this is a DC podcast, but we do love Marvel here as well, uh, just as equally. So, gotta mention that. Mm. anyway uh moving on uh and speaking of trailers we did get our first little teasers for elseworlds um we got two we got the first one after arrow and the f- and the other one after flash now i mentioned this before you started recording about uh, this incredible photoshop um not- <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um so anyway so the first teaser we get to see Stephen amell waking up um in what appears to be barry's apartment and Iris is there, and they have a bit of an awkward kiss. Um, I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be complaining. I wouldn't be complaining either. <laughs> I mean, Stephen. Stephen's a bit confused, and uh, mm. you know, there's a little bit of a joke about pancakes. Obviously, that's a bit of a joke from this season. Bit of a meme from from season five. And uh, <laughs> then she says, "I love you, Barry Allen." So, 
first of all, before we dive into this, I have to say, Stephen Amell's face acting in this is brilliant. Um, it, it, it's truly amazing. <laughs> his facial expressions in this are really funny. Especially when Candace kisses him, it's like his face. <laughs> <laughs> like, he looks so confused. <laughs> he looks great. Um, but this does confirm that the way this is going is that Stephen Amell is playing Barry Allen, yes. and then Greg mm-hmm. Gustin is playing Oliver Queen. So... I guess this is what we're all wondering, is what this actually was, and how they were going to do it, so... I yeah. Mean, what Are you happy with this? Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense, because, I mean, obviously, it's the Earth-1 variants of these characters, and obviously, yeah. I think this would make the most logical sense for them to just all of a sudden switch people. Well, obviously, they're fully aware that, like, it's, it's not how it should be, like, yeah. that they know that they're not this person everybody else around them is convinced that they are so that's that's what i was confused about because obviously another thing we were all wondering is is this going to be connected to the main canon or is this elseworlds entirely (laughs) but based on these teasers i'm going to say this is connected to main continuity which well i'm I'm pretty sure i read somewhere that um i'm pretty sure like i think mark guggenheim because he's somehow still playing a role in this crossover he said in an interview that this is our earth one version of the characters i'm pretty sure i read somewhere like in an interview I'm, I'm glad it is. I can't. I want it to be that, to be honest. Uh, but it's just because obviously the way that Steve the way it was like, yeah, it's you yeah. know he's, he knows because when she calls him Barry Allen, he's like what, <laughs> and like even like in the other one which we'll get to, you know, Grant Gustin is like what the hell's going on. Um, so yeah, I I'm quite happy about that. Uh, I really like this first teaser with with Stephen because I love how weird they play it. Like, yeah like the music and everything it's dead creepy and all like, cause, like yeah it's, yeah it's, it's kind of something you see for horror film and it's yeah, like what's happening yeah. on screen it's like quite funny so it, it was a bit yeah it was weird because it shouldn't work but it based does. on like the two things but it just does because like, Stephen Amell's facial like, acting yeah I like when the elseworlds logo pops up there's just like this really distorted like whisper of iris going i love you barry allen like a really like faint whisper of it like it's really strange. yeah and i like the fact they're playing it strange because it is weird and i like the fact that they're playing into that um, but that's pretty much all you get from that teaser. And then we did get um, one for The Flash as well, where we see uh, Grant Gustin in Argus with Diggle. Uh, I was surprised they were with Diggle. I, th- I thought they were going to go with Felicity, but I guess yeah. maybe they wanted to make this one different than the other one. Um, mm. I thought they were literally going to do like carbon copy, but with mm. Grant and, and Emily, but they went with Diggle. And I like that. And he's basically doing some one on one training, some hand to hand combat, and he's blocking all of Diggle's shots, uh, looking very confused while doing so. And then he just punches Diggle to the ground. Which is funny because Grant is obviously quite a small guy, yeah, quite a small frame guy, and David Ramsey's bloody huge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like d- I, I David. I've stood next yeah. to him. He's massive. Yeah, I mean, I mean, can you confirm when you stood next to David Ramsey? Was his like arm muscles bigger than your head? Yes, I can. <laughs> his biceps are like, I mean, I'm not gay, but I wanted to squeeze them. Um, <laughs> and also, he's like ridiculously tall as well. This doesn't come across, I don't think, enough in the show. David Ramsey is massive. Like, I know because. So Right, you show me your photo up. He like he towers over you. Yeah, he does. He's massive. I remember god. when I walked into his tent, I just like looked up at him. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> amazing guy though. Dave Ramsey's amazing. Oh, um, <laughs> I need heroes and villains next year already. Also, yeah. Quick note as well. John Barrowman's going into I'm Celebrity this year. <laughs> that, which is that, so that's why he cancelled Wales. Yeah, Comic-Con. that's why he cancelled Wales Comic Con. Yeah. <sighs> Bit of a shame, but. To be honest, I was, I mean, I haven't watched I'm Celebrity in a few years, but I'm definitely going to watch this season. <laughs> Just got John Barron in it. Anyway, this teaser, we get to see Grant fighting Diggle, blocking all the shots. He flips him over, and then he says, I'm the Green Arrow, and Diggle says, oh, well, I'll say. So, yeah, I think this is a really fun one, just to see, because, you know, we've never seen, like, Barry fight Diggle before, Like so that's quite fun. Uh, what do you think about this one? Did you, do you like this one? Yeah, I thought it was. Um, I thought I thought it was good. I mean, obviously, same as you, I was kind of expecting like one with him and Felicity. We just like to kind of, you know, be be a bit similar to what we have with Oliver. Um, but yeah. no, I thought I I really enjoyed it. And like you said, it was just funny to see Grant Gustin. He's obviously he, he's not as physically built as you know as David Ramsey, but like getting to see him just completely destroy him, like block all of his punches, and then just get him to the ground, like. That was that was fun to see. I mean, the thing is, is that with these, you know, these little like short like teaser promos, there's only so much you can take from them because they're literally yeah. only about twenty, 20 seconds, seconds long. Yeah. But like, it, it already has me like intrigued and you know, a lot a little bit more excited about the crossover compared to before. Because I think we've pretty much established on here that out of the two of us, I'm the one who's a little bit more skeptical towards it. Whereas I know obviously you're 
a lot more psyched up for it because you're on the deluded hype train. Yes. But I mean, I, I will admit that it got me a little bit excited. But uh, fuck Ruby Rose. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm very interested to see her actually in the trailer. <laughs> oh because... god, I, I, I bet yeah, I'll just be there just cringing <laughs> and then I'll make yeah, a rant video. I mean, we'll have to see like how she actually does in this crossover. Because the thing is, I remember like we were so excited about Batwoman like coming into it, and then they said, "Oh, they're doing the show, like they're doing their own series." I was like, "Oh my god, amazing!" And then they announced Ruby Rose. Ruby Rose. All hope was gone <laughs> in the space of about two seconds. Um, oh god. But yeah, it, it's it's very cool, and uh, yeah, we 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 should get that full trailer very very soon. Um, now that's pretty much it for the news. Uh, we'll move into our reviews. So we're going to start off with Supergirl, as always, with episode 5, Parasite Lost. Not too bad. Not not too bad. It was alright. <laughs> <sighs> Fairly enjoyable, in part. Um, I, I, didn't, I, uh, I didn't hate this episode for once. Uh, it was borderline average. Borderline average. I didn't love it. Didn't hate it, didn't like it, didn't dislike it. I was just meh the entire way through. Like, I don't know. It's one of those episodes where it's like, I I guess like the positives and the negatives outweighed each other, but at the end of the day, I didn't really find much to be very eventful from this episode. Like, it, it was pretty forgetful for me. Like, at least with episode four and like episode one and two, they were just, they were so terrible in some moments that they were at least kind of enjoyable, you know, in the so bad it's good terms. For me, this was just borderline boring. Like, this was probably the most boring one to watch, just because it was just quite uneventful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me personally, like, I found, like, the overall stories of it, because there was, there was three different things going on in this episode, like, three yeah. different stories, which is, which is what you normally get in these shows. Like, you know, this isn't just, like, a Supergirl thing. This is, like, all the shows, really. You normally get about three storylines. But what I actually appreciate about all three of them is that they're actually all connected. Yeah, all, which was which, which, yeah, which was a nice difference because usually with all these shows, like all the stories are not really that interconnected. No. But it was like with all these, they like they start off obviously in different positions, and then you come to the final act of the episode, and they all converge, which is is interesting. But I don't know, it's just for me, they weren't. They just, they just I didn't really care all that much about any of them, and they kind of felt a little bit predictable as to where they were actually going with it, like the outcomes of all of them, you know, with what they do with James's story, what they do with with um, with Alex, and, and and also, you know, with John as well. It's just, like I said, wasn't terrible. I just wasn't really that surprised by it. I have a question about about James. Yeah. Shouldn't he be in jail right now? Yeah, because everybody fucking knows that he's Guardian, except... Well, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know at this point. Like, I, I don't even... Th- cause I, I, no, I, I swear, no. Because they said, you know, oh, if you go out as Guardian again, you'll be arrested. And then in, in episode four, he went out as Guardian. He went out as Guardian this episode as well. Surely James should be in jail right now. And again, yeah. I think I said this last week about last week's episode. If they said, if there was like a line of dialogue where they said, oh yeah, well, he did something to protect the city, he protected loads of people, blah, blah, blah. That'd be fine. But there isn't that line of dialogue. So, yeah. so, so you know, without that line of dialogue, I'm going to say yeah. no, that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Besides, wasn't Guardian only like one scene the whole episode? Yeah. He caught, it's like right at the very end. Um, yeah. It made me laugh though, because it's like, you have all that big speech that, you know, Benjamin Lockwood makes about, oh, we need Guardian to protect us. And then after all that fucking speech, he's literally on screen for like three seconds. <laughs> we have that amazing wire work. <laughs> oh, the wire work is truly phenomenal. It's so it's obvious. Just that flippy. Yeah. To... I, I couldn't quite tell whether it was supposed to. Like, I didn't know whether to laugh or not. <laughs> I was just kind of sat there, like, is this like supposed to be serious? Am I meant to be laughing? <laughs> who who approved this CGI? <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I don't want to hate on this episode too much because I hate on Supergirl like all the time. And like I say, I didn't hate this episode. Um. I think that there are some other stuff as well that that was quite good. Like, I think the whole healing alien character, like what was his name, Armadé. Um, yeah. I actually think the actor who portrayed him was actually really good. Yeah, he's really good, really um, good. Actually, believable as a person, um, which is funny because he's not a person. Uh, but yeah, he was actually really good. I liked his story, like because Kara and and Nia they go together to like you know go talk to him and stuff. And this was obviously this is like their building of their relationship. Because uh, obviously we, we've been told that they're going to be getting like this sort of sisterly bond. We haven't really seen it yet. 
but this is them finally getting to that so i i like this building of the relationship also i need to mention the opening scene of this episode so you have this rooftop party going on nia's there and this is like her introduction to all the other characters oh my god are they heavily pushing this nia brainy thing like yeah brainy walks in and then like nia starts like playing with her hair and getting all like fidgety and like brainy obviously just being like the awkward guy that he is is just like oh yeah blah 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 i I saw you it's just like i told you i'd find you and then she's just like oh well why didn't you call and it's like uh, I, I, I don't know how i feel about this at all yeah it does kind of feel as if they're kind of shoving it down your throats it doesn't feel very natural and i think it's just kind of their way of being like oh look at us we're having a, a transgender character with you know and a, 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 like a character who's ai it's just like yay you know it's just it's it's not it, i would be fine if it, if it didn't feel forced if it felt natural but it's really feeling forced to me it's just feeling as if they're trying so hard to shove it down your throat. It's kind of like a lot with a lot that they're doing this season, especially with its themes and like its like political beliefs and stuff like that. It's just no, it's not a relationship that I'm looking forward to. It just reminds me straight up of Lena and James and the way they set that up because it literally came out of nowhere and it felt forced. It didn't feel natural. That's what this feels like. Yeah, it's it's really it's it's a bit odd that one like the whole james and lena thing although i will say i I said this to you before this is like the first episode ever where i i very slightly bought james and lena as a couple only slightly because there was some kind of energy though there was a little something no no i didn't buy it no but i wasn't you know not nothing sparkling but there was a little something um but yeah there's this near and brainy thing we'll have to see how it develops but i just it's just weird to me especially because it just kind of came out of nowhere like these two characters who you wouldn't normally expect and then it's just like oh yeah but <laughs> we i made a joke to you about this the other day but like if they put nia and brainy together they're really ticking all the boxes aren't they oh yeah it's like every relationship possible in the show <laughs> a transgender and ai together just like, look at the accomplishment goals for equality that that couldn't be more supergirl um <laughs> so yeah anyway we had all that Brainy's great in this episode, as always. Gotta love Jesse Rath. Um, mm. He's one of the shining stars, as is Alex. Again, yeah. Alex is great. Her yeah, those two for me have been by those two for me have by far been the best characters oh, yeah. in terms of he- hero wise. Definitely, like, um, Alex, Alex is really surprising to me because when Alex, like in season one, Alex was a terrible character. Yeah, she was awful. Like, and I just really didn't like her. In season two, she really stepped up. Season three, even more. Season four, like she just gets better and better and better. Alex for me, mm. and like I said, I think she... she's a great character now. Yeah, can she just be the main character? Can we just like yeah, make just have else... her as the main character in Elseworlds? Can we just like swap them around? That'd be yeah, good. that'd be good. Um, so there's also quite a lot of stuff going on to do. Like like Jean, he's kind of just like a little bit non-existent in this episode at times. Yeah, um, like. You know, I don't really know his point. Although, I mean, he was very good in this episode, like because he's always good as well. Like David Harewood's a great actor. Um, but like that scene when Armor Day is like basically nearly dying and he's like crying. That that was really good. Um, and then uh, th- there's some other stuff like the ending. The ending was a bit strange. Like, yeah, that that was it. Kind of went out of nowhere. The ending. It's just ugh, I don't know. Yeah. So they kind of hint at the fact that, so basically James calls up Ben and is like, "Oh yeah, we've got to do uh, what? What do you want to see me for? Can we talk?" And it's just like, so they're kind of hinting at maybe James might turn evil. But I mean, it's so obvious that this is just James like trying to get in so he can get some information on this. Yeah, you know, and it was like the, the scene before and the, the ad with Agent Liberty was kind of weird. Like yeah. it's like hold hold it. He's holding that like I don't even know what is meant to be in that tube. I, I can't even remember anymore. Like I, I don't, I don't know if it's like a metahuman like ability thing or an alien ability thing. I have no idea. But he's like, he's throwing it against a wall, and then it was like, what made me laugh was just like, James rings him, and then it's just like, it's it, when he first starts off the call, he's so angry towards him. I always found it funny how James didn't pick up on that at all. It's just like, acts it as if it's completely normal. <laughs> Because he's literally shouting at the phone with that first line. Yeah. Like, it just goes, what? It's just like, <laughs> and he's just like, oh, hi, James. Yeah, anything for you, my friend. And it's just like... Oh, um, it's like, no. It's it's just, it's it's obvious that obviously James, he's just trying to get in so he can get some information on the Children of Liberty thing and then just expose it. So it's just, you know, they'll probably try and play it off like he's evil. But again, I, James needs to be careful because he, he should be in prison, but... 
Yeah. He's not. You because... can... Yeah, got to be careful, boy. Yeah, she'll end up in prison, or even worse, with no storyline yeah. or screen time. What is worse? That That is a good question. What What is worse for James? <laughs> Being oh. in prison or having no storylines? Um. <laughs> so, anyway. Is there anything else, Supergirl? I don't really think so. Um... <laughs> boring episode they tried to push some political alien bullshit at the end of the episode because like oh we won't have john back because that like boss lady of the yeah you know the, of the do she's just like oh we don't want him back here because he's an alien and it's like well did, did you know that he was an alien beforehand that colonel Haley character strange because yeah when they bring her in like you know you expect it to be dead hard ass but then like she's just she's actually like quite sound and even there's even like a line of dialogue about that where Alex is like, you know, talking about prejudging people, and she's like, "Oh yes, yeah, she's actually, you know, I thought this person," it, and it's not heavy-handed either. But like before, I actually go, like this is just like a throwaway line, which is like, you know, I thought she'd be horrible, but she's actually all right. But then like, so they do that and they establish that, but then at the end of the episode, they kind of turn her into a dick. Yeah, it, it came out of nowhere. It was like was so out of left field. Yeah, it's... and yeah, like why would you just, why would you be horrible to John? He's such a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, Supergirl. For me, I didn't hate the episode. It didn't, like, at any points, like, outright annoy me like it normally does. So, for me, that's progress. <laughs> yeah, but that's not really the progress you should be cheering on for, really, is it? No, but, I mean, I'll take what I can get. Um, so, we'll move over to Legends of Tomorrow. We have episode four, Wet Hot American Bummer. Quite frankly, the best title in the Arrowverse. Um, what did you think about this episode? Um, I, I I really enjoy this episode once again. Um, I seem to be one of the very few people who uh, really enjoys Legends consistently because this man Declan has been a bit negative recently with his opinions, which has been very very disappointing to see. But I, I really enjoyed this episode. Um, it it was I mean the, the the highlight was definitely actually getting to seeing Constantine actually get suited up in something else that's not his trench coat. Even though if it was only for like ten seconds, and he's like immediately back in his like usual uniform, but like no, no, this episode was really good. I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was quite funny. Um, I, I like the fact they didn't spend too much time at the um, the time bureau because I feel like that was what kind of bogged down a lot of last week's episode. Was I just felt like the time bureau stuff kind of just like it killed the pacing of what they were doing, you know, wh- wh- when they were trying to you know fix the like mystical anachronisms it kind of ruined the pacing but obviously they didn't have that this episode um but now nah, i thought it was really 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 good um and once again as usual it's good and fresh in my memory because i literally only finished watching it about half an hour ago uh for me this episode was much much better than than last week for me i i, I really like this episode as well um which is nice i i i, I feel good having to uh, getting to enjoy legends again uh because i was really not a fan of last week's episode at all um this was much better i think this type of setup for legends works a lot better you know just doing something a bit more ridiculous and a bit a bit more silly um i think this works and i enjoyed the setup of them being in camp and things like that because you know sarah kind of went to camp all the time as a kid and she was able to like relive those memories ray also getting to do it but obviously ray is your typical boy scout so yeah you know and he's like so as camp organizers you know ray's like the typical by the book and sarah's a lot more chill and then one thing i loved and i mean loved about this episode was ava because yeah ava actually goes on the mission with them like ava's such a good character and like, and like what i loved specifically was that obviously they try and fit in with the kids and ava's like I don't she's know how to so be a kid. It. Yeah. She's like, I, she did. I didn't have... Because she's have a clone. Them. Yeah. Because she's I a clone. I completely forgot about that. I completely forgot from last season that she was a clone. I completely forgot about that. Because she's such like a real character. And I was like, yeah. oh yeah, she never was a kid. So like, she's not gonna... She doesn't know. And I thought that was really sweet. And like, the way that, you know, her and Sarah had to play off each other because obviously they become little kids in this episode. Constantine whips up a little potion for them to drink that turns them into kids. And I will say the little, the little girls who played young Sarah and Ava were really good yeah um, but i i just love the fact that they brought that up and they wrote that in because they could have easily you know disbanded that they could have just been like you know or not even thought about it because i forgot about it and then yeah they were just like oh no she doesn't know how to be a kid because she never was a kid you know all of her memories were like they were installed so it, i think that was really clever and i really like that and the fact they implemented that was good 
and even when you know you do see them as little kids and you know sarah's dead cool and she's sort of getting along with everyone and ava's kind of dead socially awkward and doesn't know what to do i thought that was really good like really clever writing on the legends part i thought that was really fun um constantine is fantastic in this episode as just being like the really over the hill <laughs> you know deadbeat dad of the character you know like i love that i mean they kind of showed this in the promo but you know it's like oh i'm count i'm counselor ray and that's counselor john all right cheers lads <laughs> 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 like, constantine's great what i love about this as well is that it shows constantine like really caring as well yeah because he because re- the thing is like it really shows how much he cares about kids yeah. especially and it makes a lot of sense if you've watched constantine because obviously in the last episode something big happens in that and if you've seen that, it kind of makes you understand more as to why. I think they they actually referenced the the final episode of Constantine yeah. in this episode. Um, I'm not. Did, did did you catch that when they referenced it? Well, I haven't seen Constantine, so it's it's the line where he saves the kids at the end, and he says, "I'm not losing another kid," and he's referencing oh, yeah, I, to Astra. Yeah, and he's referencing I know, I know to Astra. about Astra. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I am planning to watch Constantine. Cause it is on Amazon Prime, so I, I will watch it. Um just wait wait for the time because uh, narcos mexico comes out tomorrow so i'll be watching that oh my um, god so anyway uh constantine was great in this episode and also i have to the line there was a line from constantine that really made me laugh uh because obviously this episode kind of focuses on the swamp monster uh, <laughs> very much like swamp thing from the comics obviously they can't use swamp thing but oh. i like constantine's line you know oh i used to know somewhat of a swamp thing but then he says oh but maine's far too up north for that muppet <laughs> I don't know what that line, really like, just the fact that like he knows who he is, and it's just like, and he clearly like he's like this big dumb idiot. <laughs> just, I think that's really funny. Even though Swamp Thing's not even that, like Swamp Thing's not a big idiot. Like Swamp Thing's actually a pretty intelligent guy. But I just, I just found that line really funny. Like Maine's t- too far up north for that muppet. <laughs> I just thought that was a great moment. Um, and yeah, I mean, you do kind of get like a Swamp Thing appearance. Like, they do make like this fake swamp monster when the kids prank ava and they they kind of make it look like swamp thing so you know it's, it's the closest thing we'll get to swamp thing in this because obviously swamp thing's getting his own series on the dc universe which i think will be very interesting um I'm yeah excited about that. so it's probably yeah. the closest thing i wonder if we will actually see any justice league dark members though like maybe Zatana. <laughs> i think they could do Zata- zatana yeah i think zatana is probably a possibility he was on smallville so yeah i think, I think they could do it <laughs> um now other stuff going on this episode it, it, like yeah it was good having no time bureau stuff because yeah that did weigh down last episode nate wasn't in this at all uh because nick zeno uh he was actually his wife was uh pregnant during this episode and like the baby was actually born that's what i was trying to say yeah <laughs> the birth <laughs> actually happened during the filming of this episode so that's why nate wasn't in this episode um so that was good um the stuff with charlie on the wave rider was quite good because like zari's not really in this episode much um, no but i think she's really good where she is there i mean i've said yeah. this, i think talashe is fantastic uh and she was great here but the stuff between charlie and mick was very interesting um, yeah so they kind of they form a bond because they're quite similar characters you know they're both thieves they discuss about when they were in prison together and things now do you think they're hinting at a romance here um i think i think they could because i mean i remember remember back in like season two when people yeah. were pushing for like amaya and you know yeah. rory to get together yeah, so at like that time early in season two they were sort of hinting at it yeah so i mean maybe they could i mean considering that they're both criminals i guess they got more in line than what amaya did with it with him before and so i think it's a possibility yeah but uh, i think I've, i think we can't really base it off one episode i think you've got to Got to see how it rolls yeah. on for the it's next just, few. The thing is, in our CW, in our CW brains, it's just we automatically click yeah. on these things as potential romances. Um, it's just I find it weird to think of Mick in that way because me, yeah. I've I've never seen Mick as because he's never been given a love interest before. No, like, but I mean, they did it for Captain Cold in season one with Sarah. So I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I don't know. I don't know how that would work with Mick. It's just he, he doesn't seem that type of character, but. And mm. I feel like maybe they're trying to like, break down Mick and make him a bit more soft, which no one wants that. No, so, no. We, we, we always love... Lo- as he is. We so, always love dry Mick. That's yeah, what we need. That's, that's what makes him funny. So it's just like, I hope they don't do that. But given the fact that Charlie is, you know, very much like him, you know, I don't think they'll do that if they eventually do go down that route. But um, yeah, this episode pretty much only had two storylines going on, really. Uh, but even within the camp storyline, it just kind of split into two. Um, all the stuff with young Sarah and Ava was great. Um, 
just you know giving Ava those kind of young kid memories again I found that really sweet yeah and she even gets like her first kiss and we, we were mentioning this before we started recording that you know they're lucky they cut away before the two little girls kissed on screen <laughs> uh, they, CW would have been in some trouble there if that happened uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, and then all the stuff with Ray, with Ray and Constantine. I, I like that pairing as well of Ray and Constantine. Not really something you'd expect, um, and they do work quite well together on screen. I do enjoy that. But yeah, is, is there any, is there anything else? Um, not really. I mean, I, once again, I think this was um, I think this was probably the strongest episode since the premiere. Yeah. For me, easily. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Um, if 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 the episodes are more like this, then. I'm hopeful for what they can do with this, you know, the mystical element going into, you know, for the rest of this season. Um, oh, by the way, we should have also mentioned as I well because we, we didn't mention we didn't mention it because because we didn't mention this in the news section. I don't know why it took yeah, us till now to remember it. Yeah, it was announced a few days ago. Um, they revealed when the all the CW shows are returning for the second half of their respective seasons, but Legends isn't coming back until April, and not only that. It might even lose its time slot because uh, we just found out that Black Lightning is actually replacing Legends. So what it will be well, is no, no, now no, we're gonna. No. What, what that is is um, basically it. Black Lightning and Legends are doing what Legends and Supergirl did. So basically, yeah. By the time Legends comes back, Black Lightning will be done. Yeah, so that won't be until April, given the amount of episodes that Black Lightning has. Yeah, because Black Lightning's so... got like. 16 episodes yeah six, 16 episodes and then there's they, they usually also like to in, have like breaks as well in between yeah so there's a high chance that it maybe could even spill into, into later than that we don't really know yeah but yeah that, that that's that's something that quite unexpected it's not a good thing like legends no <laughs> i mean i mean because i mean i don't know if you viewers you know you, if you check the viewing figures or not but uh legacy of four hasn't been doing very well i mean the only episode that's gotten a million views or above was the premiere. Like, I'm pretty sure episode three, I think, had something like, I think it was, six, I think it was, yeah, which was like mega low. And I mean, even though Legends doesn't have as many episodes, it's still quite expensive to film. So those viewing figures weren't that good. I think, I think this episode did have slightly higher, but again, considering the budget this show's on, um, it, it, it I can't, I can't really say if it, they've, they've decided to do that because. You know if the show's failing or not, but it's—I don't know. I, I worry because it's having such a big time off that people will forget about it, and then the figures will get lower. Yeah, and like, I—I I think the same. Look, because look at Supergirl season three, like the not yeah, that slaughtered that. the ratings. Yeah. It slaughtered the ratings. Not only that, people just didn't care about the show. Like people really yeah. lost interest in it, and it was just—it was clear. Us two included. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we still watched. Yeah, we still we still went through it. Um. But yeah, I I'm worried for Legends now. I think I don't, I honestly, if I had to make a prediction right now, I'm I'm gonna say it's not gonna get a season five. I Damn. don't think it's gonna get renewed. I think, and given the fact that they're taking that hiatus, I honestly think they're gonna rewrite the back half of the season. I really do. I mean, they'd have enough. They'd have enough time for yeah, they've it. Got enough time, and, and that's what I mean. They're taking that time to make this the final season, so they can rewrite that back half and end it. Which is sad because, like I say, I love Legends. I don't want it to go. I, I find it strange that Arrow has actually outlived Legends because I mean I'm pretty positive Arrow will get a season eight. Um, I just I can't see Legends getting season five at this point unless the ratings drastically go up. I can't see it actually going past season five. I really don't. So mm, yeah, I think, I think I'd, I'd, is done. I'd say the same. If we were to get it season five, it would have to be mass- massively reduced because <laughs> I think. Six episodes. Yeah, because I mean. You think about it now. If the ratings are less than a million, it, they only progressively get down. So imagine if they renewed it for a fifth season, which, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if they did because this is the CW and they always make dumb decisions. Like the viewing figures would be so insanely low. That the only way you'd even break even would probably be like eight episodes. Yeah. Like I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's not good. It's not a nice situation for it to be in because this is kind of like the first time where I genuinely fear that. You know, the CWDC show could maybe get the axe, which is weird because we're all thinking about it for Arrow last season. But it's like those viewing figures are nowhere near what Legends is getting now. No, and it's yeah because I like, I think Legends is the most expensive of the Arrowverse shows to make, due to the fact that they film a lot on location. Like they, they yeah they go to actual places to film because everything else is done on sound stages or on set, whereas on Legends they actually go to locations. And obviously Legends has a lot of CGI as well. 
in terms of the powers and Constantine this season. That's why they've got no metahumans on the show anymore. <laughs> like, Wally's gone, Firestorm's gone, Nate never uses his powers anymore. You know, you never see Ray in the suit. None of the characters wear their costumes anymore. <laughs> like, you know. So I feel like, I, I think Legends is done. It, it's a shame this can't be Supergirl. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. Why, why could this not be Supergirl? I just find it crazy because, like, Legends is such a good show. And you know, so unique and so and legends, uh, but Supergirl's just the same thing all the time, and it's never in, like Supergirl's never been great. <laughs> like, Supergirl's never been good, and like you know that continues to do great in the in the viewings. Um, imagine if Supergirl was still on CBS. Do you remember the viewing numbers back then, season one? Jesus. Yeah, that massive. was like that was like that was insane. Supergirl the viewing figures was a huge then. Show back in season one, it was huge. Like, and I'm surprised because obviously I think a lot of people didn't actually realize that it went to the CW, but. <laughs> anyway kind of went off topic there but yes yeah, so legends after its mid-season finale in december it's not going to be coming back till april so sad times cry cry yeah we'll obviously let you all know if there is any cancellation news so yeah we'll move over to the flash uh we've got episode five this week all dolled up which means flash is now back in line with everything else um it's still weird though because sure i think it's still five months behind in the timeline yeah yeah it's 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 weird i, I hope they, you they don't address that i think i reckon they forgot <laughs> yeah they, they, they won't they won't address it nobody will it'll just like the crossover will happen it'll just be like oh yeah <laughs> i guarantee you nothing will will be addressed about that um this episode is quite the controversial one it's uh been getting quite mixed reviews from fans some people are really liking it some people are saying it's the worst episode ever <laughs> it's um <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle with it. Like there are some, st- yeah. there are some things in it. Re- like there's one storyline in it I really liked. Yeah. The other one I really didn't. So it's just you know, let's just dive in. So I'll start off with the storyline I liked, which was the Caitlyn stuff. Yeah, best storyline, best storyline. That was good. I, I I liked Caitlyn. You know, actually, first of all, getting a story. You know, we're actually delving into that. Next week we'll do that even more. Um, but she's looking for her father. We actually get to revisit Martin Stein's office, which was nice. Um, and also Cisco is in this episode he returns and this is the first time this season that Cisco has actually felt like Cisco yeah um, and I really love what they did with him in this episode where turns out he didn't lose his powers he can still use his powers but it physically hurts him when he does so like anytime he vibes his hands just start bleeding and I thought that's a really good character bit to add to him. Yeah. And this gives us that brilliant conversation. This is a brilliant, maybe one of my favorite scenes in the episode. Maybe my favorite scene is the conversation between Caitlin and Cisco and the Med. Nah, it, it, that that was my favorite. Definitely. So good. Like we haven't had a scene like that in such a long time. And seeing, you know, the fact that Caitlin's like, you know, you never told me about this. You never told me that, you know, it was physically hurting you. I would never ask you to physically hurt yourself in order to help me. And you know, because Cisco and Caitlin are such good friends, and we don't, we haven't, you know, we've been lacking that so much the past couple of seasons. So to see them really having this bond and rekindling, and you know, showing how good friends they are, I love that scene. It was so mm. well written, so well acted. Love that scene, absolutely loved it. And that whole storyline was great. My only complaint with that storyline is I feel like there's maybe too many characters involved. Like, yeah, I, I don't know if Sherlock and Ralph were necessarily needed there. Yeah, you um, could have really taken yeah. them out, and it really wouldn't have made that much. Yeah, because I remember there was one shot in particular where they all walk into Martin Stein's office and there's just like four of them in there. I'm like, see, it felt a bit crowded. That may mm. feel a bit nitpicky, which it is a little bit, but yeah, it's just for me, if I, if I had to criticise something, that's what I'd say. Uh, but all that stuff with Caitlin was great. I'm really excited to see what they do with her, especially because there's been some rumours recently about what they're going to do with her father, which really excite me, but I'll, I'll get onto that at the end because um, there is something I want to discuss with this episode. Um, but I loved all that stuff. But yeah, 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 same. I, I, I enjoyed it as well. I mean, by far the best story of the episode because it was the one that I was the most engaged in. It didn't have as many like WTF, like as in rubbish moments, like moments that felt like you were watching season four all over again, yeah. uh, which is what the other storylines just felt like they had. So no, no, this was by far the best one. I think what they're doing with Caitlin is just really interesting for me because it's like they're actually giving her a story because i remember like last season they're like oh we're gonna do loads of killer frost they didn't really do anything it was kind of just brought up every now and then when the plot needed it to be and they told the it, it, black. yeah the worst character ever in the history of uh, the flash 
But no, it's nice to see they're actually giving her a proper story and they're actually going to follow through with it because it is really interesting. And if it can give us more moments like this between, you know, Caitlin and Cisco, um, then all the better for it. Because I think these two characters together, they just work so well. Yeah. And then we also, there was like a mini storyline. Obviously, um, this one wasn't like as big as everything else, but Nora is living with Cecile and Joe in their house. And also, can I just mention, they do... Like, Cecile mentions Joe in this episode, but they don't actually explain where he is. Where, yeah, like, that was weird. like, oh yeah, when he comes back, I need this done. But, like, they don't say where he's gone or what's happening. Because, obviously, we, I, you know, we would have mentioned this last week or week before, whatever, but Jesse L. Martin has taken a break of, from the show due to the fact he's suffered an injury in real life. So, Joe is gone from the show, but they haven't actually mentioned where he is yet. So, I don't know. I wonder if they'll, if they'll do that or not. Hopefully mm. they will. <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Bring him back so they can kill him. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's that sort of storyline. And what I really liked about this as well is that Cecile was really good here because, you know, obviously we've been a bit weird on Cecile this season, given the yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I like Cecile as a character and I love Danielle Nicolette, but it's just like her position as a series regular hasn't really been justified. But um, and it wasn't necessarily justified here, but I liked her role in this in this episode where. She's basically telling Nora like all these different stories about Barry and you know how great he was, and then she turns it around and says all those stories were about Iris. I thought that was really nice. Like I thought that was really good, and it helps you know Nora sink into the fact that you know Iris is not the same person now that she grows into in the future, and you need to stop treating her like she is. And even Barry has that great line at the start of the episode, you know, where she's like, you know, you need to stop treating your mum like who she is in the future because she's a different person now. And they, you know that helps her kind of settle into that, and I and I like that as well. I thought that was really nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just it was one of those scenes that needed to happen because of the fact that I was kind of thinking it when I looked back on episode four. Like, surely Nora can realize that her mum won't be the same person now that she is, like all the way in the future. So it was nice that they brought that up because it's, it kind of felt like a necessary conversation, and it was nice because it really like hit home and it kind of like progressed the story forward, you know of trying to like calm the you know the tension between her and iris so yeah i i i really enjoyed it it was just a shame that uh the rest of that storyline couldn't be like that or at least yeah. for the most part <laughs> which we'll get on to <laughs> yeah i mean uh i kind of want to leave that for the end but like um, yeah the uh Let's talk- the nora and the nora and iris thing is actually resolved in this episode or at least like you know they pretty much for now it. for now yeah you know they uh have this conversation where Nora gets given like Iris's baby book, um, and she basically realizes how much of a good person Iris is and all the cool stuff she's done. And then, you know, her and Iris have a conversation. They're laughing, they're smiling. It's all happy families. And it seems like based on the promo photos for next week's episode, they're on good terms. So, you know, it seems for now all that's resolved. My only sort of I do take umbrage with this scene because she's writing in the in the in the journal with speed force symbols, and they don't say anything. <laughs> They're never going to explain it. Just stop this? getting worked up about it. They're never going to explain it. It's so weird to me. Like, why aren't they... Oh, I thought I thought we were going to get it this week. I really thought we were going to get it, but then we just... You know, they just <laughs> don't mention it at all. Like, this is the Flash. Like... They don't answer questions. They just pose them all. The fact it's still there makes me think it's still in their heads. Oh, anyway. But all nah. that's resolved now. And I think it was like a good amount of time spent. You know, five episodes mm. of conflict. I thought that was good. Yeah. So, pretty good um yeah yeah so there's also the other storyline going on like the main storyline uh barry and iris investigating a new metahuman who has uh joined central city in the form of peter merkel aka ragdoll uh ragdoll was great he um, was a really really interesting character and, the only thing is the only thing is i just don't feel like they did enough with no, him definitely not and we need him more of him and it's like I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows by now that obviously there was a deleted scene yeah, that the CW yeah, uploaded, absolutely. which we'll talk about later. But it's just like, I feel like there was so much more with this character that they really could have done. And I hope we see more of him. I, I, like, if we see him again, maybe sometime this season, yeah. which again would have been further driven home had they not fucking cut out that scene. But yeah, yeah we'll, we we'll would. Uh, uh, yeah. She, he, I thought he was just really fun. Like, yeah. he was so creepy, like, the way he was moving, because Troy James, who obviously plays him, is a real contortionist, and the fact that this wasn't CGI, and this is just him doing all these body movements, like, it's so scary, and 
like the cracking noise of the bones was just added to it because you find out that how he got his powers was he was literally physically crushed by debris from the falling satellite and obviously the satellite had dark matter so that gave him his power so anytime he like contorts his body like a bone cracks it's just like it's a horrible noise but it just adds to it i love the fact they went the horror route with this yeah because they really needed to convince like considering what the character is i guarantee you if this was season four that would have been so silly they would have yeah such a silly villain yeah they actually made made it scary which was good Uh, i really like that and also i have to say his you know music adds a lot to these things and his theme is great yeah i mean creepy I mean, it's not Ricardo Diaz levels of awesomeness, but it's no, uh, it's it's pretty pretty pretty, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. good. I mean, I, I I was saying this before, like in my review, but like every Arrowverse like villain has to have like a great theme. Now, yeah. I mean, your you know villain of the week type villains don't normally get a theme, but the fact that this one did, I think, says something. Because obviously, like obviously Ricardo Diaz, he has a great theme. Prometheus has a great theme. Deathstroke does. Malcolm Merlin did. Uh, Reverse Flash does. So I think like you know. It was nice to actually give, like, basically this, you know, villain of the week character a theme, and the fact it suited him so well was really good. I love this character, and I really hope he does come back, but we'll talk about that. So, Barry and Iris get to spend a lot of time together in this episode, which is good for all you West Allen fans out there. And uh, we get to see them basically doing bits of CSI work and journalism work once again, which is great. It's always good. Um, And then they kind of move into these different conversations where Iris is sort of realising that, you know, the way she acts now impacts Nora in the future and there's that parallel which I did like that conversation between Barry and Iris where she's basically bringing up her mum what was her name Francine yeah Francine yeah I like that I thought that was a nice parallel and the fact that she's kind of realizing that you know she kind of is pushing Nora away in a sense even though she's not intentionally doing it and then that ties in with like Peter Merkel and his mum and like you know she pushed him away which led him to being a criminal and I like that also can I just say Ragdoll like his crimes were completely odd like because when he first shows up he like steals like a necklace so i was like oh he's a jewel thief and that works for his character because the way he can sneak into places fine but then like in the next scene he full-on blows up a building <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's, 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 that's like wrong. what kind of what kind of a criminal is it is it terrorist is he a yeah. thief yeah because like, and plus no everyone's everyone's rather nonchalant about that building coming down like i mean i hate to get socio-political but that was like some 9-11 shit <laughs> that building went down <laughs> It's just like a massive building in Central City just like got crushed to the ground and no one really mentions it. <laughs> like no one's like, that was quite a big thing he did there. Because it wasn't even just like a bomb went off and like exploded. Like the whole building came down <laughs> and no one like really cares about it. Maybe um, it's just a normal thing considering the city was almost sucked into a fucking portal at the end of season yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think all that stuff was good. I, I like the parallels. That was, that was nice. Um, anyway, let, let's just talk about the finales. <laughs> of this episode so you get the big final fight barry gets kidnapped and is put under the power dampening handcuff things and he's tied to a chair on top of a rooftop and iris and ralph get there and i i will say i did as silly as it was i did quite enjoy the ralph swinging yeah around the city as like spider-man that was quite cool because he has that hero moment where he walks in like let's go save the flash and then like he, and then you know he says mm. oh i, I want to try this thing i saw it in a comic book i was like oh what's this gonna be and I've thought about this in the past. I thought, couldn't Ralph like just swing around? And then he goes and does it and starts swinging around the sea. It was very silly. It was very comic booky, but I, I did quite enjoy it. Season four, season four. It was very season four, especially like his facial expressions as well went back to very. Oh like, Ralph, God. Ralph is a bit more season four Ralph in this episode. Yeah, which I didn't like. Yeah, which is a bit of a shame because all I've done this season is praise how well they've done Ralph as a character, and this was like the first hint where I was like, oh, this is a bit you know bad memories uh but anyway the finale we see barry get pushed off the building and this brings us to possibly the dumbest moment in the history of the flash this uh, is like this this defies all sense of logic ever known to mankind this like, is like I'm... savitar levels of dumb <laughs> iris jumps off the building after barry with no hopes or pretenses about potentially <laughs> surviving she just jumps off with this key to try and unlock the handcuffs hoping to dear god that she will be able to unlock it in midair so that barry can <laughs> speed and then catch her and then... i mean what was going through her head here? like surely it would be much better given that ralph was there for ralph just to jump off because ralph could jump off a building and survive because he could just flatten himself it's fine and then like create like a massive 
you know, trampoline out of himself to catch Barry. Why did Nor- Iris feel the need to <laughs> jump off the building? Oh my god. This, just this, this really was season four. Like, honestly, I could get into all the logic about the fact that she would only realistically have about three seconds before she probably died. Yeah. Because, like, the truth is, you fall from a height, the longer you fall, the faster you go. So I'm sorry, but, like, uh, like th- that really feels like a moment where they genuinely put character over logic and yeah, actual also, story. I hate to get scientific with this, but I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere that if you're falling from, like, a massive height, like, from a building, you'll pass out before you hit the ground. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, like, you know, I don't know what Iris was necessarily thinking here, cause, and I bring this up because I know this, because I actually, this was Tom Cruise who said this. I remember this was around the time Mission Impossible 4 came out when he was filming the Burj Khalifa stuff. And he would say, you know, if he fell off, because there, there's, I don't know if you've seen this photo of Tom Cruise where he's sat on top of the Burj Khalifa. Yeah, with, like, yeah. Like, no strings or anything, he's just sat on top of it. Like, the spire of it, right at the top. I've of seen this photo. Oh, if, God. if you viewers don't know, I used to live in Dubai, and I've been in the Burj, I've been, you know, at the top of the Burj Khalifa. It's fucking big, right? <laughs> so he sat on top of it. You know, it's the tallest building in the world. So he sat there with no strings, and he's saying, you know, and it was on Graham Norton, it was. And he was I like, remember this, yeah. yeah. Graham Norton was saying, you know, did you think about falling? And he's like, yeah, were you worried about it? He's like, well, you know, you know, Tom Cruise being as cool as he is, he was just like, oh, yeah, but, you know, I, you know, they, t- they say if you fall to the ground, you'll pass out before you hit the ground anyway, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love Tom Cruise. But this Weird is quite guy. possibly the dumbest moment yeah, in the history like, of The Flash. It is. It's like, it's bullshit. And it's like, I, I, I groaned so loudly when I saw it because it's just... Like I-, I get why it was there. They it's wanted a moment to make Iris. Just like I think there was it, so many it, other ways you could have done it. Yeah, but n- and not have it completely defy all sense of, <laughs> which is what it ultimately did. They just turned Iris into a superhero. And it's just like she just dives off a building, and I'm just like, oh, okay. Plus, I mean, isn't there actually a Supergirl reference in this? I, like, didn't doesn't like Nora call a Supergirl or something? Pretty or, like, sure, yeah. Like, he like turned into Supergirl or something like that. I seem mm. to remember a Supergirl reference in there. But, like, like it serves a purpose because it's supposed to show I- uh, Nora, like, how badass Iris is and the- what she's willing to do for her family and what have you. But, again, there are so many other ways around that that you could have done that without turning Iris into a bloody superhero. We tried that last season, writers, if you remember, and we didn't like it, you know? When you hit episode 16, do you remember that, writers? Um, you know, we've tried to make Iris super in the past. Not a fan. So, you know, the fact they just do it again. And this was even worse. Because at least with Iris being a speedster last season, at least, you know, she had the capability. Here, she just jumps off a bloody building blind. Yeah, it's... Stupid, man. Good God. <laughs> it honestly, like, ruined the episode. It's right at the end as well. It, like, ruins the entire thing. It was just absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, so let's talk about the end scene. So, like, the, the deleted scene. So, oh, the CW messed this up so badly. Like, and it's so obvious they know they messed this up because they released it on YouTube immediately, like after the episode aired. Like they they knew they messed them up here, and I don't know what happened here. I don't know why this was cut, or like if it was a mistake or the editor forgot to put it in. I don't know, but this scene was clearly meant to be the end credit scene after the title card, and mm. it shows Ragdoll being put in prison, which I assume is Iron Heights. And also, why do they take his mask off? He keeps his mask in the scene for some reason. Anyway, um, and he has a bit of a conversation with who we figure out is Weather Wizard. Uh, or yeah. Mark, Mark, Marden. And uh, I thought this was... Re- like, this is so interesting. And this is setting up something for the season. Like, this is setting up something big. So the fact they cut this from the episode is utterly ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> Like, the thing is, it leaves me even more confused as to whether this storyline is actually going to happen or if they cut it out because they want to set it up later. Like, I, I don't know. The fact they released it on YouTube, which, again, I, I don't think I've ever seen them do that before, makes me think that this is a mistake and they were just like, oh, yeah, that we were, we were meant to put this in or whatever. But, like, most people who watch the episode aren't going to see that. So it's, just, it's kind of pointless anyway. So I, I so that you might as well just put it in next week's episode. But I just, I just find it weird because, obviously, they are setting up this... Because I think, was it a Comic-Con? Todd Helbing said that we're going to be getting like a new team of rogues this season. And I think that's what, obviously, this is meant to be setting up. 
is that Weather Wizard is like getting together the, the new team of rogues, um, which I think is a great idea. I love the rogues, and I definitely yeah. want to see. I definitely want to see it because they've never really done the rogues properly. Like they've never done like the full team of the rogues. Like, they've never done that. We've always had the rogues individually, but not really together. So I want to see this, and I think this is a great idea, especially if you're going to get Ragdoll, because again, this hint he'll come back. Because I do love the line from Weather Wizard where he's like, you know, a storm's coming, and the best place to be is in the eye of the storm with me. It's a great line. And I think that, you know, them teaming up is going to be a great idea. And it, it's exciting to see who else we might see. Like, I really want to see Mirror Master come back. I really want to see Top come back. I really want to see the Pied Piper come back. Like, there's a lot of really cool rogues they could bring back. It's a shame we can't get Captain Cold and Heatwave, but I mean, they would pretty much overshadow everyone else, so I guess that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I heard a theory recently that the rogues are going to be led by. By Caitlin's father. By Caitlin's father, yeah, Thomas Snow, who we're going to meet next week. Thomas Snow is going to be Icicle, and uh, that's basically just like a male Killer Frost. And yeah, rumor has it he's going to be leading the rogues. Now, I literally just made a video on this today as of recording this. And, um, you know, my, my biggest question coming out of this is, you know, because people are suggesting that this might be the big bad of the season. Mm. That Caitlyn's father is going to be the big bad and then he's going to have the rogues. So where does that leave Cicada? <laughs> yeah, I, th- I don't know. It's just <sighs> maybe he works with Caitlyn's father or maybe, you know, he's he's kind of um, a lackey. Or a member of the Rose. I really don't know at this point. I find you because I think... They say, because obviously, based on the future, what Nora says, they never beat Cicada. So if they just kind of, like, put it in this, like, and he gets, like, killed off halfway through the season, that's going to feel yeah. like a Yeah, so I just... I really don't know. I reckon Caitlyn's father will be, will be a secondary villain. Maybe Cicada's, like, the actual leader. I don't, I don't know at this point. I mean, until we actually see her dad... And maybe they start to tie in the fact that he could be the leader of this group. Um, f- f- until we get that, or we get, or we actually see see him on screen, I probably wouldn't go too far into it. I think it definitely could happen, but I think more it's more of the question of um, what role he'll play and whether he'll be the big bad of Cicada. Yeah, it's it's, it's just I find it strange, like you know, because I really want this to happen. I really want this rogue storyline to happen. But I would honestly prefer, if possible, just to have a full season of the Rogues. I I honestly would love that. Like, you know, you have your villains of the week being each of the Rogues individually. And then by the end, they're like all team up. Because imagine this finale against the Rogues where you have like all of Team Flash against the Rogues. Like you'd have Caitlyn as Killer Frost, Cisco as Vibe, you know, Ralph as Elongated Man. You can even bring back Kid Flash, Jesse Quick, Jay Garrick, Jay Garrick's new speedster that he's training on Earth 3, which we still need to see that as well. Um, you know, bring all them in against all the rogues. That'd be a sick fight. It'd be bloody expensive, but it'd be great. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Um, so I don't know. It's strange. Um, and yeah, the fact they cut the scene was kind of ridiculous. I don't know yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I don't, I don't know why they did it. It's, it's a very strange one. So, moving over to Arrow... Season 5, Episode 5, The Demon. Whoa! What an episode. This was this was huge. This, this, was, this was the balls right here. So, I mean, what we had... Uh, I guess we'll just jump straight in. The Demon was finally revealed to be one of my top picks. Talia Al Ghul. Um, now, this is strange, because the, the thing kind of holding back Talia Al Ghul as being like my top choice was that, well, Slab Side's an all-male prison. But... Down on level two, it appears that male and female are mixed. So someone breaks into Oliver's cell on level two, and it's Talia, Lexa Doig as Talia Al Ghul. This this blew my mind because it's like, it's one of those things. It's like it should have been so obvious that she was the. But like I think we because of the whole Leanne new explosion thing, we all kind of thought, nah, they'll they'll never use her again. But oh god. Yeah, it's just I I I was surprised. Especially because, I mean, they never, as far as I'm aware, I, we have this debate all the time, but I've, they, in my opinion, they've never cleared up whether Tali actually died on the island or not. Same no. with Evelyn. I don't think they've ever actually cleared I mean, I reckon Evelyn is dead. Because <laughs> I don't think they'll ever use or I hope she is. Again, anyway. But, like, 
I never thought Talia was dead. I was like, there's no way they're going to kill Talia. Because that's such a big DC character to get rid of her. Like, that would be strange. And the fact that she was the demon, it was just... So, I really like seeing her again. Like, I didn't realize how much I kind of missed her. Because she didn't have that big of a role in Season 5. Like, she kind of showed up in the flashbacks and then she showed up at the end. And I thought she was really good when she was there. But I loved seeing their dynamic together. The fact that this is, like, student and teacher... And she even has that great line where she's like, you know, oh, it's that special moment when your student kind of out teaches you or whatever. And I thought that was really cool. Like the one on one fight they had to do a distraction where they're basically just blocking each other the entire time was really intense, but really cool. And just shows because Talia is probably one of the only people in the Arrowverse who could actually go one to one with Oliver. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, she is the one who like trained him in Russia and obviously trained Prometheus as well. We do get so, yeah. Yeah. his name. Yeah. Right that, that, I love. I, I mean, it's not as good as him appearing in the flesh, no, but. Uh, but... I'll take it. I'll take yeah, what I can we'll take, get. We'll take the name drop. It gives us good memories. Um, so, Talia overall was great. And I have to mention, I mean, the action in this episode was great. But in particular, I mean, we always talk, you know, as superhero fans, we always talk about Marvel and their Netflix shows and how they always are the master of hallway fights. But this gave it a bloody good go. <laughs> this was a fantastic yeah. hallway fight. Brilliant. I mean, this was riveting. Seeing Oliver and Talia teaming up to take on about 20 guards with riot shields in one corridor this scene was epic oliver had like chains wrapped around his hands which he was using to fight people yeah that, that that was pure daredevil season two that was yeah, where he had the chains around his hands oh i mean here's the thing okay this hallway fight was never going to be as good as daredevil okay because daredevil is the king of hallway fights yeah. but oh. like you said it, it gave it its best go it wasn't one continuous shot which disappointed me but it was pretty awesome i mean my favorite bit by far has got to be where he's got the chains and he just hooks him around the guard's neck and just yeah, slams him to the ground oh my god and then you've also got that bit where it's like he defeats those three guards and he gets the final one by literally lifting him up and slamming him to the yeah. ground <laughs> Yeah, like, like uh, he, just, he just grabs him around the waist and just like full yeah. slams it. And, and as far as i could tell i'm pretty sure that was steven amell yeah i think yeah uh, i think that was because that's the thing with these prison fights that i really like is because obviously he's not wearing the suit Stephen Amell, I mean, Stephen Amell does, like, most of his own stunts anyway, but, like, you know, he really does all of his own stunts here because you have because you see his face all the time. And I thought that was great. And I love how it starts out as well. I love the line, you know, Tali says, do you think they know they're outmatched? Oliver, we're about to, they're about to find out. So good. And they just charge. And I love the fact that, obviously, Oliver's just the brute force and Talia is a bit more finesse about it. And, obviously, that plays off quite well. And, uh, yeah, they just completely wreck those guards entirely. I loved it. I genuinely think it's one of the best action sequences Arrow has ever done. I genuinely believe that. I just thought it was so exciting and so riveting. So much fun. And like I said, it was easily like the standout scene for me. And just having Talia back on the show, and given where she ends off, I'm wondering if she'll come back in. I think she will. I mean, the way they ended it, they didn't really... It didn't feel like... I don't know how you'd put it, but like, as if like it wrapped her up, up her character completely. So I definitely think there's the door open for it, for her to come back. I mean, if they're allowed to do Batman on this show and they even managed to reference Gotham like they did and basically reference Batman, it leads me to think that they probably can and probably will use it again this season. Yeah. So, I mean, they kind of make their way through the, the prison, all the guards, and then they literally have the opportunity to escape. Uh, they go down to the morgue and... You know, Talia literally jumps out the window. She's about to say, you know, she's saying to Oliver, look, this is our chance. And this is when Oliver basically says, oh, yeah, no, I need to do this the right way. I'm staying here. But he gives him the flash drive um, with all the information on level two and gives it to Talia to give it to Felicity. I find it weird that we didn't see that scene. Yeah, that that, that feels like something that maybe was on the cutting room floor because we should have seen that. I mean, even if she didn't give it to Felicity directly, it would have been nice to have seen her like drop it off at her apartment or something yeah it was just weird because it kind of like you know the next scene she just kind of got it and it's like oh, okay but like i do like what they do with talia at the end when she kills dr parker you get to see talia in her old like all black get up and she gets to take down uh dr parker and kill him thought that was really cool so talia is kind of back on the streets operating again which like i say now that she's out in the wild i wonder what she'll do i mean she does have ties to diaz obviously her being the demon that that was revealed she is the demon and basically she reveals that how she survived the lian new explosion was due to diaz's drugs um, yeah so she has got ties to diaz which does make me think you know 
whether she'll come back as a villain or as a hero or kind of somewhere in the middle. But I think she was really awesome this episode. I loved seeing yeah. her. Love yeah, I, I I don't think I realized how good a character she was because like I really liked her in season five. You know, during the flashbacks when she was interacting with Oliver, like I I really enjoyed that. And I was like, you see her in this episode, and it's like you forget that those two they really do work well together. Yeah, Lexa Doig is really good. Like, she's yeah, a great actress, and she's a great Talia. Um, because I mean we've had like quite a few good live action or like you know even just different versions of Talia, like obviously the animated series, the Arkham Arkham City. Uh, even Dark Knight Rises with um, you know Miranda Tate and things, we've had like good versions of Talia. So the fact that this one's still able to stand out is is really good. Um, also, she does hint at Batman as well. Yeah, so like, she's a, like with a foe in Gotham. Definitely Batman. It's got to be. I mean, it could be Batwoman, but no, no Batman. I I, I, I prefer Batman. to think Batman. Yeah. Also, Flash dropped a Gotham name drop as well this week. Uh, in that building that got blown up and. Uh, but anyway, back to the good show. Arrow is, uh, <laughs> just having having Talia back, and all the prison stuff was great in this episode. Some of the, I think maybe some of the best prison stuff we've seen. And Oliver gets to go back to level one as well as level two was shut down. Uh, also, Stanley gets to talk to Felicity in this episode, which I, I really like that scene. Uh, you know, yeah. he basically just he basically just explains to her what what level two is and what's going down and what's going on with him. And can I just say yeah. the synopsis for this kind of lied because. When uh, there was that line in the synopsis where it's like, oh yeah, Felicity finds out something that shocks her. Like, nothing really happens. No, not really. I mean, the thing I, I, I find interesting about the guy that Stanley's talking to, and you never get a clear view of his face, I feel like that's setting that up like for a storyline for him. Which scene? You know the bit, obviously, where he reveals to Felicity, you know, what's going on with Oliver. Yeah. You know, but just before, and he's talking to someone. Oh, the lawyer, yeah. And he's talking to a lawyer, but we never actually get a good look at his face. I think maybe they'll bring that up later on because it just felt weird to me. That just like they'd have it there, and I think it's probably there for a reason for me personally. Like it's probably going to come up later. Hmm. I, I maybe feel maybe you're looking too much into that, but we'll... what do you mean? They set it up in the first episode that he's like he's he's not meant yeah, to yeah, be I know, there. I know, but I mean, I just feel like you know they had nah nah son i mean i'm this is a different arrow this is best schwartz best schwartz i love the fact that i've got She's you preparing on the best for this. Schwartz hype train yes you have i'm officially on the best schwartz hype train because she is she's the best and uh she is. we did have another storyline going on in this episode to do with dinah laurel and felicity uh dinah i have to say was really good in this episode she's, she's actually sinking into her role a lot more now Basically, she's actually she's not being a lot. bitch at random times <laughs> she's not like she's not all of a sudden arresting known for three years yeah uh she's basically she's basically just becoming lance um, yeah which i'm fine with because if this means that we can get you know black siren as the new black canary i'll take that mm. and uh i'm perfectly happy with diana kind of sitting this out so mate if if black siren becomes the black canary i i, I will just die happy <laughs> that's all that's that's all I want. I would love for it to happen, and I feel like it probably will. Like I say, just based off what they're doing with Dinah and uh, Laurel. Yeah, there's a lot of like interesting stuff there, and uh, but their scenes together, obviously, just going through the records, trying to find evidence with um, level two. Felicity, yeah, yeah with, with Felicity, Felicity, yeah, was uh, was really interesting because you know Felicity's just like so adamant, and she did have a quite a bit of overacting in this. Um, but I, mean, oh, I guess that's to be expected at this point. Um, <laughs> all their dynamics were great. Seeing them all, I, I see a lot of people, you know, calling it like the mini Arrowverse Birds of Prey. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, is nice to think about, but it's it's not quite. But, you know, it was still cool to see. And I like seeing all their dynamics together, especially because the, the way that kind of all wraps up with Laurel saying, oh, yeah, let's go for pizza together. Um, I've seen some people saying that was like really cringy and too much. And I was no, like, no, I liked that because I mean, I it's it. showing the fact that these two characters, you know, lasses were at each other's throats, you know, are getting to a place where, you know, the Earth One counterparts were at, you know, because they were friends. So I, I thought that was really nice to see. And like I said, I feel like it's just going to progress even more because it really is just kind of showing that Laurel is starting to really, you know, trying to, you know, interact with these other people. And you know to try and get to know them because I think she's definitely going to join Team Arrow. Like yeah. she has to. Yeah. And I feel like that's what they're doing. Yeah, because I mean she's not like a villain anymore. Like, no. She's, you know she's even though she's not necessarily a hero, she's just you know just a 
citizen. Yeah, just a, just a I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd probably stick with her as more of an anti-hero. Like she, she's, I think her intentions you can understand and agree with. I think she just takes it a bit more of an extreme compared to the others because you can definitely tell that. I mean, just, just the torture scene that she had on the silencer last episode. Yeah. So that that I think that's definitely what they're probably gonna do. If they stick with that with her character, I'm fine with it because I I think it adds a little bit of something different to the team. Yeah, I, I see people kind of compare her to be like the Arrow versus version of Catwoman. Uh... As as it is in the sense that you know she will sometimes be good, sometimes be bad. Yeah, um, I, I, maybe maybe like I said, I, I have a feeling they probably will turn her more good by the end of the season. So yeah. I do, yeah. I, reckon, I don't know. I we'll... become the Black Canary. Yeah, I, I, I think she will. I, I'm, I'm still waiting for her to get a new suit. I saw a cool fact today because uh, today is actually the four. I believe it's the four year. Four year anniversary. Year on it. Since yeah, since they, they first unveiled the Black. Yeah, yeah since oh, they first yeah. unveiled the Black Canary suit for Laurel, and I actually found yeah. out as well that uh, you know after Laurel was killed in season four, they actually let Katie Cassidy keep the suit. Oh, did they? Yeah, so Katie Cassidy has actually got the Black Canary suit. Damn. That makes me super <sighs> jealous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, normally like these studios just, and things, they never let yeah. them keep the superhero suit, but they let her keep the Black Canary suit. I think that's sick. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, Stephen Amell was able to bring a like, what was it, one of the actual bows, bows from yeah. the Arrow set. I mean, he technically stole it for Comic Con to give to the girl, but I mean, if, if you can, if you can bring a suit off there, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I, I reckon they'll let Stephen Amell keep the Green Arrow suit. Oh, they, the they have to. They have to. Yeah. And he probably and he probably still give it away because he's such a nice guy. Steven, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't fit into it. it. Doesn't matter. I'll just keep it in like a magic case. You'd, you'd just want it, wouldn't you? In like one of them vaults that just pops up, and it's just like yes. you'll stare at it every day and think, "I am the Green Arrow." Yeah, I'll, I'll basically just do that every morning. Like it'll pop up, and I'll just go, "I am the Green Arrow," and then I'll it'll oh. go back down, and I'll walk off, and I'll be like my fulfillment done for the day. Um. And also, I want to be a vigilante. Uh, also, there was a lot of other stuff going on in this episode, and I think overall this episode was just really, really great. Like I say, all the prison stuff was probably some of the best prison stuff we've seen. Having Talia there was excellent. I feel like there's a storyline I'm forgetting about. Uh, Curtis. That's the one. See, I mean, there is a reason I was forgetting about it, because it was forgettable. Because um, it, it was the least interesting story. It wasn't bad or anything. It was just like, in comparison to everything else, it was nowhere near as interesting. Like, in, on its own merits, it was all right. It's just, you know, in comparison, you know, I, there were some good moments, though. I like that Curtis, you know, basically said my days in the field were over the day Oliver went to prison and, you know, saying how much he's lost ever since he's been Mr. Terrific, like his marriage and things, which is true. It, it was, you know, it, it was a good justification as to why Curtis didn't want to go out in the field. Uh, but he did get some cool moments. Like, I do like the scene when he had the briefcase with the little gun that came up and... You know, that 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 reminded me of Breaking Bad. That, that I won't say why because it's spoilers, but uh, that that gave me a little bit of Breaking Bad vibes there. That reminded me of Mr. Terrific. Like that felt very Mr. Terrific to me. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that that's the kind of thing that I want them to do with Curtis this season. Like because they got it spot on there. You know, he, he no no play him off as a geek, but someone who's obviously very smart and confident. Like that's what I want from Mr. Terrific. Not someone who's just like like greasing all, all his hair up and and just like being completely incompetent like if they do that with him then i'm completely game for that yeah because I've, I've always said this but I, I i really love what they've done with curtis this season because i've never liked curtis in the field i think it's a stupid idea yeah. because he's just yeah like you say entirely incompetent and then he's no good back at base because they've got felicity so he's not needed there the fact he's working in at argus and R and I think is perfect and they've really nailed it with him this season and yeah, all this stuff. Because, I mean, every time he had to go out and suit up and, like, you know, tie up his hair and put it into, like, uh, put it into cornrows, it's just so unrealistic. It's such a minor thing, but it's just, like, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like what they do with Curtis. And all this scene was good. David Ramsey was great here. Got to be Daddy Diggle. Uh, doing all those lovely Daddy Diggle speeches. And yeah, all this stuff was good. Just didn't feel as, you know, fun or exciting as everything else going on it was still all right in its own good like in its own right yeah it was, uh, it was still good anything else um <sighs> arrows just killing it really by like, it just like look i went into this season like excited but a bit skeptical mainly because of like last season it's just like how disappointed i was but it's like 
this generally so far, for me personally, has been the best start since season two. Like I'd say so far, I'm enjoying it more than I did the first bits of season five. Yeah. Like it's just the prison stuff. And it's weird because like this is the longest stint we have had without Oliver suiting up at all. And yet I'm not bored by it. Like I've seen some people online be like, oh, I'm bored of the prison stuff. For me, honestly, I'm not bored of it because they're bringing something different to it. It's like it's adding something new to the mix. And like I I just feel like I'm never bored with Arrow. Even when like an episode is better than another one, I'm never bored. And for me, as long as you're doing that, like that, that is like probably the key trait of an episode. And it's like it's it's just doing it consistently, and like the characters feel better. They feel like they're not being written as complete idiots. I mean, sometimes there's some exceptions, but like, like I'm just so impressed by Arrow. Like, just um, especially like I said, just like I am on the best Schwartz you know, hype train now because like she's, you can just tell she's made a difference. Like, just yeah. so clearly. Like it it, it feels. Like, this is what we should have got with season six. Yeah. Th- this proves why, with TV shows, you need to switch up showrunners just to keep things fresh and to keep things, you know, moving along. Because, you know, we have Mark Guggenheim for the longest time. And, you know, season six, as much as I kind of, you know, I was all right with it, it it, it was kind of stale. Yeah. The, I mean, the last it, five it just, episodes are amazing, but... It just, it just felt like they were kind of just treading through the same... Yeah. you know steps i mean the amount of storylines they repeated in that season from prior seasons was just ridiculous like it, it was clear that like i don't know whether they were contractually obligated to do that season or they just run out of ideas out of they like out of ideas halfway through i don't know but it was just like you could tell that, that, that they weren't really trying to create anything you know that they felt like it, it was like bringing something new to the game whereas with this with the prison stuff and everything else that they're doing with the characters because they're like they're in like completely dif- different positions to where they were. Like it feels like the characters are actually going on a story arc that you're not just like getting mad at, like with the you know the, the Team Arrow split last season. Like it's just it's like like I said, like, I I don't remember being this excited for Arrow for me honestly since season. Like I'm saying, I think it, this is surpassing season five so far, which is a good feat by itself. I'm just I'm, I'm, words cannot describe. Words cannot describe. Yeah, I mean, I just like it's so fresh feeling this season. It's so dark, and you know, it's re- like this truly feels like season one levels of dark, which I'm loving. I mean, season one is what made me fall in love with the show, and I feel like you know this is just really doing a good job. And Beth Schwartz stepping stepping in, being able to just keep the show feeling fresh seven seasons in, is really impressive. And and I know that we're not exactly the same when it comes to The Walking Dead this season, but for me personally, with The Walking Dead. You know they've got a new showrunner, Angela Kang. I think The Walking Dead feels really fresh again. It's well, I'm not saying I'm. Hey, 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 I'm not saying The Walking Dead is bad. I'm. I still think it's decent. I think I still think it's really good. It's an improvement over the past three seasons easily. Like it's what we needed. I'm just not completely on the OMG nine out of ten camp. I'm not in that area just yet. I think I can, but I won't deny that they needed the change in showrunner because like if you just stay with the same showrunner so. Long, the ideas and like the imaginations and like the creativity, it just goes. I mean, look at Daredevil. Daredevil's had a different showrunner for every single season. Like, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but it's been a different one each season, yeah. which I think works because you're constantly bringing new things to the table. You know, every season feels fresh. It doesn't feel like a repeat of one another. And like, I think more TV shows should be like that. I'm not saying that like. You should just be firing showrunners, even how for how good they are. But it's like it's it's all right to change up, and I think like it's just proving that Arrow needed this really bad. Yeah, I think it works really well for for, for Beth Schwartz, and you know I think this season has been really good at just showing what she can do and all of her fresh ideas. Because that's my favorite thing about the season; it it just does feel fresh, and they're taking so many daring ideas. Because you know the prison stuff, committing to it as as well as they have, is really bold. And then obviously. I never expected the flash forwards. Like, that's, like, the most interesting and unique thing Arrow has done in a long time is the flash forwards, especially because that's the way they actually brought in Roy, and I never thought they were going to do that. I mean, I still really hope Roy comes into the main story. Maybe he breaks off. Maybe he joins in to break Oliver out. Maybe. Maybe. That's how we see him. But, uh, yeah, I think it's great. And this episode, for me, was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved it as well. Um, probably my second favourite episode behind the premiere for me personally. I think this edges out 
episode three just. Okay, well, I'll, I'll rank, rank the, the five Arrow episodes. Um, this this is a lot tougher than I thought it'd be. Um, ooh, I'd say episode two at the bottom. Um, then episode four, then episode three, then episode five, then episode one. I'm gonna go two, three, five, one, four. I, I really like episode four. I'm not gonna lie. I really liked level two. Uh, I mean, I mean, four is very good. You know, obviously with the flash forwards and all of that. But um, in retrospective, I think my problem with that episode was that I wasn't the hugest fan of like like some of the things that they did with the other stories. I think when I look back on on it, you know, the, the the Laurel and Felicity stuff. Although I enjoyed it, I just I don't know. I just like when I rewatched it, just Felicity just. Some of her acting felt a little bit cringe in those moments, and obviously there was the bit at the end where it was like you realised that it was intentional, but it still didn't take away from the fact that like that when I'm watching her act at times, it's just like I kind of feel the inclination to want to like skip forward, which is like the first sight of you know that, that a scene just isn't getting you. And there were a few moments like that in that episode. That's why I can't really put it that high. Like to be honest, episode one is really the only episode where I genuinely can't find like. Like a major problem, other than I thought Diana was slightly out of character. That's why for me, episode one is better than four. That's fair enough. I just I think for me, I get really overhyped by some things. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean you are this. you are you are the Arrow fanboy. Yeah, I mean, we all know how overexcited I get. Yeah, when it comes to these things, but it's just like for me, like when I saw bloody Diana in the future, and then when I saw Zoe come in as the Black Canary, I bloody lost my mind. Um, but yeah, Arrow is doing bits this season. I love it. I just need to keep it coming. And it shows no sign of slowing down. Uh, they're currently filming episode 11, which is David Ramsey's directorial debut. Very excited to see that. Um, so, yeah, let's just let's just roll it on. So that brings us to the end of episode 24. This is probably our longest episode in ages. Uh, yeah. Hour and 31 we're currently at. Um, this is a long episode anyway so thank you guys for listening to episode 24 if you enjoyed this episode make sure you share it around to any other people who you think may enjoy this DC TV content and make sure you subscribe for more every single week and we'll be back next week with all the other episodes and we're just getting ever so closer to that crossover so let's uh, let's just keep on going uh, <laughs> and as always I've been Declan I've been Dan and with all that said we hope to see you guys again next week see ya <laughs>